crash stock markets or buy them up when they're cheap or you know put small businesses out of business you know or you know cause people um mental and social problems or you know there could be people driven by all sorts of malice or horrible reasons but I don't know people's intent. It could equally be that there are others driven by good reasons. As far you know, it could be that pe- it could even be, as far as I know it, that, that, that there are people that want people um, to appreciate cafes and restra- restaurants and t- that they normally would take for granted. You know, to have a few weeks off so that they can appreciate what it is for many people that never have the luxury to go out to those sports events, pubs, cafes and restaurants, and that can't miss it because they don't do it anyway. Um, Because there are lots of people through ill health, whether physical or mental illness or poverty, that don't have those opportunities to be that sociable anyway. You know, maybe they want people to appreciate those things more and, and to have opportunity at home to meditate, to pray, to read, to write, um, to, to, to clean up the house, to look after yourself, to look after and spend more time with your close loved ones, um, to take the opportunity to invest in hobbies, um, to catch up on lots of old jobs. Um, and actual fact, um, not to be so invested in being so busy and consumed with going out and being so active all the time, but to take time out from your life, to be slower, to look at things around you, to be more considerate, um, and actually to sort of take a few weeks out from just going around the same rat race, the same kind of, the same old same things, where you're sort of constantly repeating things, and you're kept so busy that you're not able to sort of take the adequate time to stop and think. Perhaps there are people that, perhaps that's the motive, that they actually want everyone to have more time to themselves, um, to get to know themselves better with their close loved ones, um, to, to look after their own home, um, to, to actually um, appreciate what it is for those people that have been living with social isolation, not just for a few days, weeks or months, but have been living with that for years and decades anyway. Um, perhaps not to that extreme extent, because it's, a whole, it's on a kind of spectrum isn't it so people have varying degrees of isolation you know i know a lot of people with serious illnesses will tend to have a very limited contact with people anyway and and that can often with many illnesses last many months and in fact many many years anyway <clears throat> so even if um the the actual the actual virus itself um even if it was exaggerated you know and and if people knowingly spread that uh, false information there could even be good motives for spreading that as well as bad motives you know I don't know people's real intent and I'm not here to judge people I can't condemn their soul I can't save their soul either you know I don't have the power to send people to hell or to heaven or to reincarnate them or to you know to make sure their soul returns to where or to how to when or to why you know or or, or to sort of erase their soul so that they never exist again I don't have the power to do any of those things. Only God does, you know. Um, So uh, I don't know. It's not my position to judge other people and I don't know what their intent is, you know, if there is an intent. Um, You know, I suppose you could speculate. I've given what could be potential good and bad reasons for that and there are a lot more reasons possibly besides those as well. Um, Now... What are the actual reasons, to get back to that, of why I consider um, this an overreaction? Um, or why I think it seems a bit suspicious to begin with? Because I didn't quite explain that fully. Um, well, the first thing that drew my attention, I suppose, is that we've had so many other infections in the past. Um, TB, and notoriously in the um, 20th century, um, But that, of course, thank God, has got treatment now. It's just a shame that it's such a big killer still because so many people in poorer countries lack access to that treatment. And that's a real shame still. Um, But actually, um, HIV and AIDS, of course, was a dreadful epidemic. Um, Of course, that was in the 1980s. And if you believe the um, the, the facts that are reported, um, something like 40 million people currently living with HIV or AIDS... um, and something like, uh, trying to remember from when I studied it recently, um, I can't remember, but 
quite a large number, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, have, have died of it this year. But I don't know. I, it's, it's pointless me giving the statistics because I don't know. But in any case, that was a serious pandemic. Um, there were even people that allege that that was created in a laboratory and spread. You know, there were people that say that about this pandemic. Uh, and there are people alleging the Chinese have spread that um, to the Americans. People alleging that the Americans are making it look like the Chinese have done that. You know, there are claims and counterclaims going on there. And there, then there are others alleging that it's actually not a serious pandemic and that it's actually being exaggerated in order to have more control or for what other reasons these policies have been introduced. Um, but why did I think that this was an overreaction? Well, because when we had the AIDS and HIV epidemic from the 1980s and the 90s onwards, and uh, right through the millennium, that's continued to kill, sadly, many millions of people. But it's not actually the AIDS that kills them. It tends to be because the weak immune system makes them more susceptible then um, to viral infections. So it tends to be a combination of other viral infections. Um, so it's actually hard to put down what the cause of death often is. Um, but we didn't overreact to that. There were no shutdowns. There were no mass closures. You know, there was no self-isolation. There was nothing like that going on then through that epidemic. Uh, but then that tended to affect Africans more, didn't it, really? So uh, perhaps that's different. Either, well, I don't know, you draw your own conclusions from that, I suppose. Um, but there have been other kind of outbreaks um, and other conditions, of course. Um, but I guess that they people would say things like Ebola, Zika, um, that they were relatively minor in comparison. But actually, if you look at pneumonia, um, reportedly killing 3 million people each year, you know, over 10 years, if you believe those um, statistics backed up by the WHO and a variety of other sources, then, um, you know, over the course of 10 years, that's 30 million people. That's 60 million people that have died of just pneumonia um, during this millennium alone. 60 million people. Um, and yet there's been no strong regulation. There's been no attempt to isolate it or to um, prevent the spread of that infection. Um, so in, in actual fact... Um, I, you know, because there have been so these previous infections and every year, of course, we have the influenza and we have a number of people dying of that. Um, it's hard to know accurate numbers. It's several million people. The wild estimates, the rough estimates are two to three million globally. But obviously it's very hard to get accurate statistics anyway on this. Um, but there were no overreactions to that. So either we were underreacting to those things... Uh, which caused huge amounts of death and suffering. You know, hundreds of millions of people with viral infections, you know, millions of people dying of it. Um, o over years, over the last couple of decades, tens of millions of people dying of it, um, but without any of the, those kind of reactions to it. Um, either we were underreacting to those infections or we're overreacting to this one. You know, it can't be, it can't be both. It has to be one or the other, doesn't it, logically? You know, you're trapped by logic on that one. And if you don't believe in, you know, logical deduction, you know, that's sad because it's the basis for a good, solid, reasoned argument. And, and it's also the basis for mathematics and, and a great many other wonderful fields of, of study also. Um, so I think, um, and possibly we have underreacted and allowed the spread of many infections in the past, you know. But many of us have been carrying on um, by carrying good... Um, good practices anyway where we're able to you know i've been using um hand sanitizer every time i visit care homes and people with um immune compromised conditions um and trying to wear gloves and wash regularly and not cough or splurge around them and making sure that if, if you do bring up something like mucus that you know you catch it bin it kill it as they say and and that you sort of wash your hands afterwards um, but those practices should have been instituted and regulated anyway. They should have been part of our regular process, not just for the last few months, but for the last few years and decades to help spread the, um, the awful spread of influenza. Now, the deaths of influenza are no more awful than the deaths of anyone from another infection, whether it's a, a Carina strain, like uh, this um, COVID-19, 
or whether that's a different type of viral strain, you know, a death is still a death of a person. You know, the suffering of that individual is no worse. Um, the heartbreak of the family is no worse. You know, it's each death is just as valid. Each life is just as important. Um, now, in terms of the statistics, and I don't know, um, it's very hard for me to know whether these are accurate informations or not. Um, I'm not a statistician, I'm not a mathematician, although I do know that it is possible to sort of make information sort of look different than it is if you're motivated to do that. Um, but I think that um, the figures could have some doubts. Um, and from what I've studied into it is because it's possible um, that there are large numbers of people that are being identified um, with this Karina, with this co coronavirus, um, who've got a different strain of the virus. I don't know enough about that. I'm going to try and investigate and find out more whether or not you can actually identify that particular strain of the coronavirus, the COVID-19 as it's being labelled, um, as opposed to the other strains of coronavirus which have existed now for some years. Um, and it's alleged by some sources, and I don't know, not being medically trained, how accurate that is, that it could be that some strains of corona are showing up in people where they haven't necessarily caused the actual death. So that it could be that if you contract a viral infection some years ago, even if you get over the symptoms of it and it doesn't kill you, you could still be registered as having that. Well, years ago, I, I contracted HPV, human Papadopoulos virus. I may have said it wrong. Uh, a strain of HPV I contracted. So if, if, I was, if they were to do a full blood analysis of me, um, if I was to die and they did an analysis of my blood, they would find a strain of HPV within that. But that would be a far cry from saying it was the HPV that killed me. It, it would just be that that was one of the things that happened to be within my body. Um, thank goodness it has um, dormant symptoms, that particular one. Um, it only produces warts occasionally, and at least they're treatable. And for me, at least, if I treat that, it's OK. It's only if it's left untreated then the warts continue to grow there's the risk it could become cancerous allegedly um, but so there's that theory and I don't know the medical accuracy of it I, I studied linguistics not medicine so it's not my expertise um, so whether or not um, you can identify the particular strain of the COVID-19 as opposed to the other Karina strains of viruses I don't know about that um, and I also don't know whether a dormant strain of the virus would show up that had existed from an earlier viral infection that one may have already gotten over but that may still exist dormantly within the body. Other concerns over um, the, the reports about um, how accurate the test results all are is the, the number of tests that are given out. Um, there are a large number of people that may not have the tests so there could well be lots of people that are not being tested um, one report I read suggested that therefore there could be a large number of people with the conditions who are being underdiagnosed. Um, so as a result of that, um, there could be a larger number of people with the actual condition. However, um, it could also mean that the mortality rate is much lower because people that tend to underreport have milder symptoms. Because if they became more severe symptoms, they're more likely to report it going to a hospital to seek med medical attention or to a doctor's of some kind, if they have access to one, that is. Um, so it could be that they're underreported due to the lessening, um, the inability to get access to the tests, perhaps. Um, and, and there's another reason as well. Um, <clears throat> It could well be um, that many people that have got influenza are simply being diagnosed as having Karina. You know, the symptoms of these conditions can often be so similar um, that without access to the test, it could be simple for someone to diagnose one thing as the other, um, either as um, a Karina virus, um, whether it's uh, COVID-19 or another one, uh, as a 
as an influenza or perhaps diagnosing the flu uh, as uh, COVID-19. So it, it could be either way. Um, there could be misdiagnoses through lack of access to the testing, um, either showing an increased or a decreased amount of people with those infections. Um, but of course, people in poorer countries um, tend to struggle to get access to medical care. Um, so there may be uh, many people um, who, as well, not just lacking uh, lacking uh, testing um, but there may be people that are not even able to go to hospitals or doctors even if they are seriously ill sadly enough um, there may be people that are dying at home or um, dying en route to hospital or people that um, just simply um, don't like going to hospitals and they'd rather die at home and avoid going there um, but um, it's also the case um, that people can have a variety of other conditions and so actually to give you a personal story about this uh, my mother passed away recently and she had an undiagnosed viral infection um, she also had two other long-term conditions lymphedema and also COPD which makes it really a lot harder for your lungs to get over infections and sadly she had recurrent infections over the last few years um, but she had an undiagnosed one you know they don't really know often the strain of it um, and it's sad really they kept trying to treat it with antibiotics but that wouldn't do it you know and there was no treatment for it and she just it just malingered for so so long and but in the end when she died um, they just, you know, I, they put down on the death certificate for her that it was pneumonia. Um, but, you know, we don't know. Was it the infection? Um, it wasn't the lymphedema or the COPD necessarily um, because she'd had that for some years. Interestingly, lots of people are reportedly uh, to die of COPD, but really it could well be that that weakened immune system compromising them means that they can pick up infections so it could be the infection rather than just the COPD that kills them with her we suspect she had a secondary infection as well but we're not sure what strain of any virus so it's just lumped under an umbrella term as it often is as pneumonia so it's often difficult to know when someone has a variety of different complex diseases or conditions and disorders it's often hard to know what actually to put it down as. You know, if somebody has AIDS and TB, for example, do you record that as a death by HIV, by TB, or as both, perhaps? Um, you know, if somebody has this COVID-19 and they're very elderly, and we know it's um, allegedly at least affecting people that are very elderly, people that are much more susceptible to, um, to a lot more critical illnesses, which could well be why people in Italy were more uh, allegedly more affected, because they do have one of the oldest populations of the world anyway. And so when people are a lot older, they are much more susceptible to other long-term conditions, like arthritis, which affects the joints, um, but also, you know, like a variety of other conditions, that, because through wear and tear, you, your body is much less able to sort of fight off things than when you're much stronger physically. Um, so people have, um, you know, much more compromised immune systems. They're much more vulnerable to other infections. And so when you have a variety of these different conditions, it's then harder to say which one it is that killed her. You know, like with mum, you know, do you... I, and I wonder that myself sometimes. You know, was it the actual, the infection that was long-term, the secondary infection, the COPD... I don't think it was the lymphedema, she'd had that for years, or was it perhaps all of it and, and just being overwhelmed by the whole, uh, you know, the whole cluster of conditions that became too much. So sometimes it, you wonder, you know, could it be the actual virus or could it be the virus on top of having those other conditions? You know, could it have been that they would have died of those other conditions anyway, um, but that actually um, the virus or the infection uh, maybe made it... Uh, sad to say more efficient it made it you know happen quicker but it could be that people that are suffering you know some people with terminal illnesses um sadly it, it could mean that you know it, it, it kills them off earlier i suppose to to put it in those words um so people that have got serious chronic and terminal illnesses you know it's hard to say is it the virus alone perhaps that's killing them or is it that they is it the other conditions that they have at least contributing, uh, if not um, also causing the death itself? So 
in short, there's a number of lots of different reasons why I can't be too sure or accurate what those actual figures that are being quoted. So while we're being given these numbers, um, you know, um, that are gradually increasing in that, I have to be honest, uh, and I always say, you know, like, nothing is infallible anyway. Um, I'm not saying, you know, they're completely false. I don't say that. I'm just saying, um, at best, they're rough estimates, and to take into consideration reasons why there could be margins of error because that's the scientific method of doing that so it's not to say like don't pay any attention to them whatsoever it's just to say put it in a wider context where you also consider um, what the reasons are why they might not always be totally accurate and to consider that in that wider context so anyway, that that sort of um, ends the reasoning of, of why I sort of got my doubts about the actual um, the numbers that are being reported and why I, I'm not sure. Um, but just to go back to my earlier point, I suppose, um, I thought at the moment it's a situation that's ever changing and there are a wildly number of different sources out there, especially with the internet being so unregulated, you know, with the dark net and uh, the deep net and everything. You, you have got anyone can sort of um, post things. And not everyone is posting things responsibly. Um, sadly, some people are driven to sort of um, to spread fear, perhaps, and over panicking and overreacting. And and there could well be, you know, the opposite um, possibility that pe some people are underreacting to some things and actually sort of like and not taking things seriously enough. But I have to say, my I have concerns. Being agnostic about the position, keeping an open mind and not having access to all the reliable evidence, not being medically trained and not knowing, yet feeling that I'm relatively competent to investigate and to try at least and look at things. Um, I have to say that I'm relatively agnostic despite having my concerns and suspicions. I will keep an open mind and I, I will try not to be judgmental and judge people um, beyond um, what I know and I will try to report things that are accurate. I am concerned and, 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 and I, hang, I think I've got two different fears. I think, if I'm honest, I've got fears of um, an epidemic of a pandemic that could be spread and could affect lots of people like an influenza. But I think there are also fears of the effect of having a long-term shutdown economically, socially, psychologically, emotionally um, and what kind of effects that can have on people um, and that if that was to become a long-term thing uh, I would really have serious effects about um, people's mental health, physical health, you know, th there could be a, um, a huge, um, there could be a huge rise in self-harm um, in people, um, suicides, you know, that's a real genuine risk. Several million people globally commit suicide each year, according to statistics that I was able to sort of glean. Um, so there are genuine concerns for that, you know, and in terms of the economy and the long term effects, you know, people say, oh, well, it's not about the money and that. Well, it's easy to say if you've got money, isn't it? But actually widespread poverty is more likely to cause um, lots of other problems. So it is also a financial consideration as well. It's not all and only about money, but th there are concerns about economic factors, social factors, psychological factors. Um, but there's also a spiritual dimension to this as well. And I want to go back to that and end on this note. Um, so whatever concerns there are, and I have my fears, um, both in terms of the effects of a possible long-term government shutdown um, and the, those type of policies, if it became more long-term, but also concerns as well, and I can understand others' concerns about possible pandemics as well. Um, but I think in terms of a spiritual thing, what I would say, my kind of feeling is that I would not treat anything anyone says as infallible. I wouldn't treat any source, even well-intentioned people that really have made an effort, um, they've investigated, they've spent hours and devoted maybe even their whole lifetime sometimes, their careers to studying information. They might have taken risks in reporting things um, that they feel could jeopardise their own reputation, even their life perhaps. Um, they, they, they might say things that could be upsetting or provoking, but, but 
we always have to bear in mind that people are human and people can make mistakes too, even with the best will of the world. And I want to say, based on what I've said, they're just my thoughts, if you like, my ramblings on it anyway. And that uh, I don't really know, and I framed it in that context of being agnostic and not knowing about the situation. Uh, I gave my reasons of why I've got suspicions anyway, uh, why I've got my concerns, but also why I have to be cautious what I say about that um, due to the legal situation. Um, because spreading false information knowingly um, through written word is libel and through spoken word is slander. And I wouldn't want to knowingly spread false information about anyone or anything. Um, I don't want to be accused and I don't want to spread any fear about things. Um, but at the same time, I want to say what my genuine concerns are. I'm... I'm um, in terms of how I treat other people, um, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not going to go out and invade anyone's personal space and I'm not going to cough or splurge near anyone anyway. I'm going to keep good hand hygiene. Um, I'm going to try and wash regularly after cooking, toileting and especially after coughing or sneezing. Um, and I'm going to carry hand sanitizer and toilet tissue paper around with me and in case anyone else should need it. I'm not going to invade anyone's personal space or get too close to them. And I'm going to respect people's rights to have their beliefs, even if I might disagree with it sometimes myself. Um, so I think that's my sort of general thoughts on the situation. And I actually think, um, going back to sort of making a sort of um, a spiritual note about this, that this may be a good opportunity for us all to spend time alone getting to know ourselves better. You know, what kind of writer are you? What kind of a viewer are you? What kind of a drawer are you? What kind of a thinker are you? What kind of a conversationist are you? You know, what kind of a person are you? You know, it's asking questions about yourself, isn't it? And, and if we're always around other people all the time, we're, we're, it's good that we're getting to know other people and investigating others, but do we take the time to get to know ourselves? to investigate ourselves. And I suppose from um, a theistic point of view, you know, the theistic nature of this is that only God is totally infallible and trustworthy. You know, God is the only source that will give you trustworthy and true information about things. Um, whereas we as humans, we're not infallible. You know, whatever books we write, whatever documentaries are directed or acted in or produced or uh, uploaded or you know we all can make mistakes and we all can do bad things on purpose sometimes so I think it's trying to sort of examine ourselves as well as each other in a fair and consistent manner but not treating each other or any other sources therefore in a godlike manner as if they're beyond any criticism or beyond any suspicion um, or should or should have a godlike authority. Uh, we should we should be extremely cautious about idolizing anyway, because that way is where madness lies. If we, I think there's a there's a real genuine concern of either demonizing anyone or deifying anyone or anything or any group of people. So those are my general thoughts and um, about the whole situation. What I'm doing at the moment, as and when I feel necessary, is just writing down my feelings or uploading videos um, just to make a record of what all my kind of thoughts are trying to do a concise account of all the important points and then so I can at least go back and view it um, and it's there if anyone else wants to view it um, although I tend not to get many viewers if any actually um, but um, I think it's kind of important to actually think to yourself and talk to yourself sometimes so at least you have the chance um, to self-examine and to sort of like say, oh yeah, these are the, this is what I think and actually this is why I think that. And actually when you're talking with other people in a dialogue, it's good because they can ask questions of you. But during um, a self-examination, when you are able to talk and think in monologues with long meditations, what that allows you to do is talk uninterruptedly and so that can allow a kind of like a sermon like nature so that allows you to investigate a subject much more wholesomely so that you're not just like giving one word twitter responses that are limited so that you're actually able to dedicate a much more 
lengthier piece to something to do it more justice because complex subjects you know can be looked at from a variety of points of view and and really take a lot of information you know when you're looking at a complex court case for example it can be extraordinarily long because examining the evidence for and against something um, takes a lot of time it takes a lot of studying it takes a lot of thought and issues can actually be um, something that's really um, mind-boggling and, and actually thought-provoking and actually take up a lot of time um, and, and require a lot of energy and devotion so so I think actually it's a good opportunity for us to take this opportunity at the very least um, to examine ourselves, not just about this subject, because there is a danger that, as well that we could self-obsess about this and I could just spend every minute of the day going around just thinking about how many people have died of viral infections. You know, when I kind of think, and I'm not going to laugh about that, but I just, I, if, I, if I look like I was smirking, it's only just because the ridiculousness of that to me is just that 60 to 70 million people died reportedly last year. Uh, you know, 100,000 die every day. Um, thankfully, more than that are born every day, though. Um, so, but I don't spend every minute of the day last year um, or the years before that obsessing about death. Yes, there is a time and place to think about that, but there are many other subjects and things that are just as worthy of your attention and study as well, of course. Um, so I think it's really important to sort of study and participate in a variety of things where you're able to, of course. Um, so I'm going to end it there because I have sort of rambled on a bit now and... Um, I'm going to sort of um, make an uh, update um, when I feel like I know more credible information if I get to that point, that is. It's been really hard, as it is with all investigations that are complex and beguiling, just because it's sort of one of those cases where you look at it, the more you know, the more you don't know so somehow, just because you sort of like read all these sources claiming one thing and then you read all these other sources claiming other things and other sources in between things and then there's other sources and you know so you're getting evidence and counter evidence you know any complex difficult court case will always be like that and the most important thing in a court case in any kind of case like this is always not to prejudge a situation before you have taken adequate time to examine all of the evidence first because otherwise, you rush the judgment, you get to a verdict too quickly without actually properly taking into due consideration all of the appropriate evidence that needs to be properly examined and inspected thoroughly. And so that would be the only thing I urge. And I just want to say as a last note, I could be totally wrong in anything I say. I'm not infallible. I make mistakes often. I have to be honest, try to be accurate where I can be here, but I do make mistakes. Um, I'm human like anyone. And if I do ha and I have made any mistake, I will later um, upload or post a retraction with a, a, an apology to. Uh, but I wish everyone well during this time. Um, and um, I'll uh, leave off now.